Okay. So good morning, everyone. This is the last day of our eight day online retreat and it's all coming to an end rather soon, but of course it's not really the end. And uh, yeah, I wanted to start by reading a lovely little poem that um, someone here sent in for myself and Ajahn Bramali. I'm not sure if they want to be identified. <laughs> okay. So it's a very lovely poem. I think it probably comes from a deva in disguise because it sounds quite similar to the um, poems in the Deva to Samyutta to me. And it's called A Wise Person. Wise is the person who does not believe every passing thought appearing in their mind, who generates joy recollecting the virtues of self and other who, seeing only the result of causes and conditions, gives kindness, compassion, and non-judgment to all. <laughs> so there it is. And that was dedicated oh, okay. to Ajahn Bramali and me. Yeah, really lovely. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand over to Ajahn Bramali for his morning session. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, very <laughs> good. Okay, thank you, Venerable. And thank you for all of those people. There's been a few people who've been writing verses, which is nice. Yeah, that's really, people have obviously find some joy in the suttas, which is marvelous. So, uh, we're going to continue, obviously, where we left off yesterday. And today, we're going to start off by looking at the seven factors of awakening. Yeah? And uh, as I mentioned before, these uh, seven factors of awakening are very similar in structure to the dependent liberation sequence, yeah? the how suffering comes to an end, the, the causes for the ending of suffering. It's just a really an alternative way of looking at this. Uh, so uh, we don't need to go into them in great detail, uh, but uh, they kind of reinforce the same message we've been seeing throughout this retreat. Uh, so this particular sutta, SN46-1, uh, is called the Himalayas, and, and uh, SN again, connected discourses, and 46 is the 46 factors, all on the awakening factors. Yeah, the, the last book of the Sagutta Nikaya, the connected discourse, is very interesting because it's all about the path of practice. And, so every chapter is about one kind of set of path factors. The first chapter is about the eightfold path. Next chapter about the awakening factors. The third chapter about the satipatthanas, etc., etc. It goes through the whole thing. So it's actually a very nice sutta to gain a deeper view of the Buddhist path. So just uh, 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 just do some advertisement there for the Sagutta Nikaya. <laughs> now this is the very first sutta about the Bodhisattvas that we're looking at here. Uh, and uh, I have uh, taken out some of it and just focusing on the main aspect here. So this is how it goes. So, uh, based upon virtue, established upon virtue, uh, a bhikkhu or a mendicant, yeah, develops and cultivates the seven factors of awakening. Yeah, and thereby they achieve greatness and expansiveness in wholesome qualities. Uh. And how does a mendicant based upon virtue establish Established upon which develop the seven factors of awakening. Here, a mendicant develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and matures in letting go or release. And then the other factors of awakening, uh, they develop the awakening factor of uh, discrimination of qualities. Uh, yeah. Some people say investigation of the principles and various translations are possible here. Uh, anyway, we'll come back to that in a second. The awakening factor of energy, the awakening factor of rapture or joy, the awakening factor of tranquility, the awakening factor of stillness, uh, and the awakening factor of equanimity, even mindedness, if you like, uh, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing in. So this is a standard exposition of the seven factors of awakening and in that list you will see, as I pointed out before, some very strong similarities with the 
uh, dependent liberation sequence, you have the rapture there, which is the peak, you have the tranquility, you have the stillness, yeah, and they are almost exact, they are exact parallels to what you find in the other sequence. Uh, there are, however, some differences here, but you will soon see that those differences are more in name than actually in, uh, in um, the, the, the actual felt quality of the, uh, of the factor. But uh, let's start from the beginning. So the interesting starting point here, as always, is start by talking about virtue. Yeah. And the idea of virtue has to be established for all virtue established upon virtue, and it kind of reinforces this idea that all meditation practice, all development of the mind, especially through meditation, always has virtue as the foundation. We can see here the themes of the suttas are the same. They recur in sutta after sutta uh, in the, you know, different contexts and uh, in slightly different wordings and things, but the general themes are the same. There's a, theme that there's a very strong sense of integrity here in the suttas, all fitting together in a very beautiful way. And again, this is, the I think, very much a consequence of one genius, if you like, one uh, spectacular mind which actually stands behind this and who has made, expressed these uh, suttas uh, for the benefit of humanity. That's how you get that kind of integrity here. So based upon that, uh, you then cultivate this awakening factor and factors. Uh, and the awakening factor, what it means, it means it doesn't mean a factor which partakes in awakening. What it means is a factor that leads to awakening. It's specifically said to mean that in the suttas. Uh, and so it is important to kind of get these little things like that actually matter here, because then it is something you develop because it has a certain result. The other one, which might be an interpretation, which some, sometimes people use, but which turns out not to be right, is that these are the faculties that actually exist in the awakening experience. But that would be a misunderstanding from the pseudo point of view. So these little distinctions can often make a big difference because they, uh, they, uh, it's how you relate to the path that really matters here. And um, so uh, seven uh, factors of awakening, yeah? And um, uh, then you achieve greatness and expansiveness in wholesome qualities, yeah? And of course, when the Buddha talks about greatness and expansiveness, and, Qualities, it, the Buddha is always a bit understated. And, yeah, he does not kind of, he doesn't add to, the, uh, to what is said. He doesn't use adjectives unnecessarily. He doesn't use awesome all the time. He uses awesome very sparingly. You may have heard Ajahn Brahm, he translates the Pali word sadhu as awesome. That is maybe one of the few places where it is uh, kind of useful. But, but the word is very kind of low key. When he says something is great and expansive, well, that really means great and expansive. So that we can take to mean <coughs> essentially that you reach awakening through this. That's the point of this. So what are these seven? The first one here is the awakening factor of mindfulness. So, yeah, and usually the way that is to be understood is that that refers to the Satipatthana practice, yeah, the mindfulness meditation. And uh, you will see this throughout the suttas, this relationship between the Satipatthanas and the Bojangas, yeah, the mindfulness meditation and the practice of awakening. They're always very closely related to each other, one leading to the next one. And because Satipatthanas is the one that develops the awakening factors, uh, it is what kind of forms the foundation of the awakening factors. So that is why it is right there at the very beginning. Yeah? It's a starting point. Yeah? So when you develop Satipatthana in the right way, the awakening factors emerge out of that Satipatthana practice. So in fact, if you, I don't know how well you know your sutta, some of you will know your suttas really well, and you will know that in the Satipatthana sutta, there's four parts to it, and the last part is called the Dhammanupassana, the contemplation of uh, uh, mental factors, maybe something like that, or principles, depending on how you translate this. Uh, and in that contemplation of mental factors and principles, you find the seven factors of awakening. Yeah? So these are specifically developed within the uh, uh, Satipatthana practice. The very last part of the Satipatthana practice is as if Satipatthana leads to the development of these things. Yeah? It culminates in that. Uh, 
So what we are dealing with when we're dealing with the seven factors of awakening is meditation practice. Yeah, it starts with Satipatthana and takes you all the way to awakening. And the whole thing in between is just meditation, meditation calm and insight, both of the two together. Um, an important point here is that uh, you know, one of the questions that often arises uh, is how do we practice Satipatthana? How is it to be done? There are so many manuals on Satipatthana practice available, uh, and there are so many different interpretations. You have the Mahasi method, you have the Inka method, uh, and these are probably only the two most famous ones around the world. No, but there is a lot of methods, some of them very idiosyncratic by uh, you know, individual monks, like the uh, mindfulness of the movement of the, of, of the hand, just moving the hand up and down, and all kinds of strange uh, meditation methods. Uh, so what to, do the suit then say? What, do, what is the, the advice that the Buddha gives on the development of Satipatthana? And what is interesting, and I think it's a very important point that is often uh, passed by is that there is only really for one practice to develop the Satipatthanas all the way to the end. And that practice is mindfulness of breathing. And that's the only one you need. Yeah, so if you have if you do mindfulness of breathing and you kind of get into that, and I admit mindfulness of breathing is quite tricky, it's very easy to use too much control to, to not be able to relax properly, these kind of things. A lot of people have problems with that. But once you start to get into it and it starts to work for you, it takes you all the way to awakening. It fulfills the Satipatthana. You don't really need to do anything else. And uh, I think that is a very useful piece of advice, uh, specifically because the Buddha says so in the suttas. Uh, and also because Anapanasati is a very common practice in the sutta, something that you see in so many different places. Uh, so when it says here, you develop the awakening of mindfulness, yeah, Basically, you can say that is the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, that kind of that's what it sort of comes down to. That would be the main interpretation of that and in those words. But there is also an alternative interpretation. This is also found in the suttas, and that is contemplating dhamma, yeah, contemplating the discourses, reflecting on them. And this particular contemplation is the same contemplation that we looked at yesterday. Yeah, you have the Dhamma Nusati, the contemplation of the Dhamma, which then gives rise to the joy, and then the Pasadi tranquility, and the Samadhi, and yeah, those all the steps we had to look at yesterday. Uh, so that is the alternative here, is the Dhamma Nusati, the contemplation of the Dhamma. I think from that, you can actually expand, I would say, this factor of the Bojangas, the seven factors of awakening, it can be expanded to include any of those six contemplations or reflections we were talking about yesterday. Anything which gives rise to that joy, yeah? anything that gets you going in your meditation and practice, gets you established in those whole qualities, yeah? which get essentially, which gets these Bojangas, the factors of awakening started, that would be sufficient to be called the mindfulness factor of awakening. Yeah? Because with the joy comes the mindfulness, etc., etc. All these things that revolve around each other. Yeah. So um, that is the first starting out with um, basic meditation, and from that meditation, as we have seen before, uh, I'm going to leave aside the based upon seclusion, dispassion, cessation, maturing, and release for now. I will get back to that later on. Just let's leave that out for now. Right? So the next one then, and um, is the is the awakening factor of discrimination of qualities or investigation of qualities. And one of the things to understand about the awakening factors uh, is that they are sequential. Yeah, so one builds on the previous one. Just like normal eightfold path is sequential, it is a causal and condition path, each factor leading to the next one. The same is true of the awakening factors. It is specifically said so in the suttas. I haven't, I haven't got that sutta here, but it is specifically said so elsewhere in the suttas. So you start off with mindfulness, much general mindfulness, and then you go on to the discrimination here of states of qualities. And what this means is that you understand your mind in terms of good qualities, bad qualities. 
blameworthy qualities, blameless qualities, dark qualities, bright qualities. Yeah. In other words, you divide the world into things that are wholesome and unwholesome. That's essentially what it comes down to. Uh, and part so this is that you need to investigate this. Yeah, very, very often in a meditation, you find yourself going to a plateau. Huh? It kind of stops, yeah, and you don't get any further. You kind of the mind, the mind develops nicely in meditation. You get more and more peaceful. You get some joy. It reaches a certain level, yeah, and then it kind of tapers off huh? and it comes to an end. It doesn't really go any further. Huh? And then the question is, why does it stop at that particular point? And the reason is that there is some defilement in the mind, yeah, that actually is blocking you from going further. There's some, not necessarily even defilement, but like an attachment. And a very prominent part of that attachment is attachment to the sensory world. Because it's very difficult, as we have discussed, to map your senses completely and to say goodbye to seeing, goodbye to hearing, goodbye to feeling your body. It is hard to completely let go of that. To the point where you have no longer have access to this sensor. But not having access, I mean literally, you can't even go there because your body is so profound and so peaceful. And that is often where we have to do the investigation and where we have to uh, learn to distinguish between the truly bright and beautiful qualities uh, and those things that we are attached to that are less bright and less useful. So we investigate these things. And as we investigate, this as we uncover the problems, the sticky points on the path, yeah, and the modeling gets more established. And as these factors get established, the, the factor of energy arises. Yeah. Energy again is very closely related to the gladness of the mind. Yeah, when you're glad, you're energetic. When you're glad, you're both mindful and energetic. In the in the sutta, you have these three qualities that always revolve around each other: yeah. gladness, mindfulness, and energy. Energy is virya in Pali, huh? mindfulness, sati, uh, gladness, pamuja. And these three, they revolve because when you have one of them, you tend to have the other ones as well. Huh? They kind of come together. You can have mindfulness without joy, but it's going to be weak, not, not very stable. Yeah, but once the joy is there, they kind of stabilize in a sense. So they become real awakening factors. Huh? So, now, yeah, you can start to see now how energy, gladness, mindfulness, all these things come together. And for this reason, these factors that you are seeing now actually are very closely related to what we were seeing before. Before we looking about the sila being the basis for, for regret and then non-regret coming being gladness. And here is a similar kind of thing. We are purifying the mind of defilements, which is an aspect of that sila using mindfulness of energy, which kind of are conjoined with the gladness. And you can see how all of these things are very, actually very close to each other. They are different angles on the same ideas of developing the mind. And uh, just since you have to be quite familiar with the suttas, yeah, you have to know how they work. And uh, this is um, one of the joys, I think, of kind of looking into the suttas and seeing these connections and, and understanding them. And I've been doing this for I guess close to 30 years now. So you know, after a while, you, you start to see the big picture, the big, all the jigsaw uh, uh, pieces fitting together. One picture, the picture called the Dhamma, and each piece you can see how they relate to each other and how they work together. You know? And it gives you a broad understanding of how the Dhamma works. And it's I don't know, for me it's necessary because I'm you know. I guess we're always like slow sometimes. So the more you kind of see what's going on, the more you kind of confidence, I think, and you get this teaching, the more it transports you onward on this path. So then the energy is there. And when the energy is there, that is when the sequence again it takes off. Yeah, the sequence we have to look at all the time. So then you get the awakening factor of rapture. This is the PD, and just what we saw before. Yeah, the energies, the powerful joys, and all that kind of stuff. And the uh, tranquility, and where you really, really calm down. And if you know, you kind of become like this rock sitting there, you don't do anything in the whole world. Uh, and from that arises the, uh, in the other sequence, first happiness, and then samadhi. And here goes directly to samadhi. And then on the end, which is uh, translated as equanimity, it could also be rendered as even mindedness. Uh, and uh, the reason why that is added is because if uh, all 
when that's hard, it is not enough. Saying that you get to the first jhana or something and that is not sufficient. Well, you have to keep on developing that samadhi till it reaches its creation. The fourth jhana is then <clears throat> the awakening factor of equanimity, where the mind is completely removed from any worldly concerns at all, where all joy and happiness has disappeared, where you have the happy nor uh, pain, yeah, this complete neutrality, and where the mind becomes the most powerful of all that. And when you take it to the fourth jhana, well, that is the end of the mental path. That is where the awakening factors. And when you get to that point, then awakening happens almost spontaneously because the mind is so powerful, provided you have nothing. And that provision is you have to have a right view. Uh, yeah, bang, and then you make that breakthrough and you see reality as it actually is. And we'll come back to later on how that happens. So, so um, those are the seven awakening factors, and again, they are part of the three, seven aids to awakening, which the Buddha summarizes this as his teaching. Yeah, so this is the core of his teaching. And then it adds here one more time. I just want to very briefly touch on this as well. It's based on seclusion, based on dispassion, based on cessation, and it matures in release, or you could say letting go. Bosanga is the Pali word here. And what does this mean? Well, what it means is that real meditation practice, yeah, if you're going to take it really, really deeply, what we're talking about here are real about things, yeah. If that is going to work out properly, it has to be based on seclusion. You have to withdraw from those senses, which are go by definition go out into the world. You cannot go out in the world and withdraw at the same time. These are opposites. You have to choose. Yeah, and the choice here is to go into seclusion. Because in seclusion, there is less of that worldly distraction around you. Less chances that the world will. Uh, take you outside of yourself. This is also why monastic life is a celibate life. We're not even celibate, it's a non-sexual life, yeah? Precisely for the same reason, because ideally you go within, you go out. All of the essential pleasures are external things that take you outside of yourself. So you seclude yourself. So first of all, in Buddhism, you have the physical seclusion, the kaya viveka, yeah? The, bodily seclusion, you go to a hunt in the forest, you go to a retreat center, you go to your little room in your house or your corner where you sit for yourself and whatever it is. And then from that physical seclusion, that is where the chitta viveka, the seclusion of the mind becomes possible. Yeah, so seclusion here is really the, and one of those critical things, and the more you read the suttas, you start to see how it Props up, pops up everywhere, the idea of seclusion. Slightly different wording, slightly different way to present it, but it turns out to be a very important part of the Buddhist So uh, for that reason, if you are a very keen meditator, I would really recommend you to sometimes to go on the retreat. And, yeah, it can be a person retreat, or it can be like, even if it is a community of people, as long as it gets you a bit out of your ordinary environment, uh, into an environment which is more, maybe in the countryside or in the forest where everyone is heading in the right direction, where you keep the eight precepts and these kind of things, that would be very supportive of in meditation, if you are ready for it. If you're not ready for it, not so much, but if you're ready, then it's very supportive. And then you have this idea that it is based upon dispassion, the Pali word for dispassion is a viraga, uh, I think a better translation here is fading away. That is what uh, uh, Bhattu Sujanto has as his translation. Uh, because uh, uh, from, from fading away, you can the cessation. Yeah? Here you have the two words, fading away, cessation. Fading away means it's gradually, gradually disappearing. Cessation means it comes to a complete end. And the idea here is that uh, as you meditate, things fade away and disappear. Yeah, and this is a factor that is required for the meditation to work. 
and the body has to gradually diminish to fade away. The senses have to gradually fade away. The defilements of the body have to gradually fade away until they cease completely. And that is where you then have the opportunity to enter samadhi. <clears throat> so this whole, pro whole process is a process of fading away and cessation. Yeah. And um, for some people, this sounds scary. I don't want to cease. Yeah, I don't want to... What's going to happen with me if I cease? But uh, of course, it is scary if you try to think about it, if you try to intellectualize it. But if instead of intellectualizing it, you actually just experience these things, and, and then you know these things are not scary at all. In fact, from the exact opposite, they are extremely attractive. Yeah, you, you know this already because you're all meditators, that's why you're here. You know that when you become even a little bit peaceful, it's already very beautiful. And this is just a deepening of that peace. So you can imagine how marvelous it is. So these are the other things that form this process. Yeah, the more things fade away, the more they cease. And then as a result of all of this, it ends in release, it ends in letting go. And uh, the main thing that we let go, of course, uh, is craving itself, uh, because craving uh, is, cannot really happen when there is nothing there of any interest. Uh, and that is what you see through this whole process. Nothing that was interesting. If not, nothing is interesting, well, then craving must disappear by people. Uh, OK, so that is the seven factors of awakening. In brief, um, I have some a few short little suttas that I thought might be nice to have a look at at this point, so just before we get onto the big sutta at the end, which is the mindfulness of the head. And um, this next sutta is again from the Devata Sanyutta. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the fifth sutta called Murmuring. And uh, this uh, it's how it goes. So first of all, here you have a devata, a divine being, saying a verse, and then presumably the Buddha responding, although it is not said who is responding here. It uh, could be the Buddha or maybe some other wise, uh, wise being. Uh, so this is what the divine says. Uh, when the noon hour sets in and the birds have settled down, uh, the mighty forest itself murmurs. Uh, how fearful that appears to me. Uh, and the wise being responds, the good hours have been, and the birds have settled down, and the mighty forest itself murmurs, delightful that appears to me. So here we have again this idea of seclusion. Yeah? If you try to go into seclusion before you are ready, if you try to go into the forest, you know, you know what it's like to go into the forest. The forest can be delightful, but if it starts to get dark, yeah, and it's dark around you, and it can be quite, it can be a bit scary to be in a forest by yourself in the darkness. And uh, there is a sutta, even the Buddha, before he became the Buddha, the Buddha to be, this is the Bayabera Sutta that happened before. The Buddha talks about his experience before his awakening, and he too was fearful in, in the depth of the forest in the middle of the night, yeah. And he would hear sounds, and the sounds would mag magnify them, and would feel much worse than they actually were. So, for ordinary people, if you're ready for the forest, it can be a scary place. But if you are ready, especially if your samadhi is very profound, yeah, your samadhi, your mind is free of defilements and all that, that is when you're ready for seclusion. And then that which is frightening for ordinary people becomes delightful. It becomes delightful because. Uh, here is your chance to kind of get away from all the worldly problems and business uh, and just to delight the beauty of the forest and to delight in the stillness, the peace, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then it becomes so powerful. Uh, and then it becomes, you know, and this is why, as we mentioned today, some of the greatest arahants in the suttas, uh, the greatest monks, the monastics, monks and nuns, they delighted in nature uh, because it has a positive effect on the ordinary. Uh, city life and, and village life, where the uh, five sense pleasures are kind of in the abundance and you indulge in those things. So, so again, this is just a small suit and just to show uh, the idea of seclusion when it is right for you, yeah? When your samadhi is coming together and your defilements are disappearing, that is the time to 
and find that seclusion for yourself. In the meantime, you find kind of partial seclusion or you just uh, practice wherever you can. Uh, anyway, so then let's come to the next little sutta. This is also from the uh, Deva Kassang Yuta. This is number 10. It's called the Forest. And uh, so this goes as follows at Savati, standing to one side, that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Buddha. Those who dwell deep in the forest, peaceful, leading the holy life, and eating but a single meal a day, why is their complexion so serene? <laughs> so the Buddha replies, they do not sorrow over the past, nor do they hanker for the future. They maintain themselves with what is present, and hence their complexion is so serene. Through hankering for the future, through sorrowing over the past, fools dry up and wither away like a green reed cut down. So um, here you have this. Uh, Devata, yeah, who is seeing something not to be expected, and someone living deep in the forest, and yeah, there's no sensual pleasures available, you're just living by yourself, no company, no partner in life, none of those things. Uh, and yet, they are peaceful, leading the holy life. They only have a single meal a day, no entertainment, no nothing. They sleep on the bare ground, yeah. How come they're so happy? This is kind of the idea of the complexion being serene is really just a, a metaphor or a simile for the happiness of someone. Yeah, you look at, their, look at them and they just look happy. How can they be happy when they have, they have not one of those things that make you happy in the world? Truly, really, they should sorrow and be ter have a terrible time. That is not so. Yeah? This idea again, that when you see something, it opens up new possibilities. It opens up a... Uh, an alternative view of looking at the world and looking at meaning and thinking about life. And then the Buddha replies, yeah, it is actually, the problem is not the sensuality, the problem is how we use our mind. And if our mind is always uh, thinking about the past or thinking about the future, yeah, in other words, full of desire, hanker, hanker is one of these Word. I don't know how to translate with the word hanker. It just sounds like it comes from a different age. I, I certainly I don't never heard anyone who uses hanker in ordinary language. But I guess it means like longing for or desiring the future. Uh, or you sorrow over the past. Oh no, I had this. Yeah. And, and I, so you're always desiring something. You're never really satisfied in the present moment. You're always agitated. You're always restless. Uh, or you have lots of anxieties and fears, yeah, because you don't know where you're heading and, and things don't seem to be going as you would like them to go. Huh? And of course, all this restlessness, desire, this lack of contentment and satisfaction, the anxieties and fears of life, but this is obviously what uh, uh, reduces that uh, the beauty that comes from having good qualities, yeah, because uh, uh, you're not really happy in this way, not satisfied, you're not content, uh, and you were able to tell. Person's face, whether they are reasonably content or not, especially if you observe them over a long period of time. And this is what matters. This is the problem. This is where we go wrong. Yeah? So, by giving that up, uh, that is where you start to uh, you, you become happy. You're living in the present moment. You're enjoying the peace that is here and now. You don't worry about the world. You go inside it, and then you find something beautiful and profound. And so if you, but if you keep on handling and sorrowing over the past and future, then you dry up and wither away. <laughs> yeah, it, they, call, you, they call the person a fool. Fools dry up and wither away. If you desire for the future and you sorrow over the past, then according to this, you are a little bit foolish. So again, the bar is set really high. Yeah, it makes us all sometimes see it seem a bit foolish. Yeah? This is the reality of, of this, but it's okay to be foolish. Yeah, we don't have to have to feel bad about that because that's just part of life. Sometimes being foolish, sometimes being deluded. At least we're heading in the right direction, which is great. We're becoming less foolish over time, but uh, it's a nice aspiration to have overcome our foolishness, uh, overcome our delusion. So we can stop 
withering away, yeah, like as it says here, uh, then we are on the right track. And mindfulness then uh, is the first part of that. Uh, so this, again, is just a reminder of uh, the real meditation, the real uh, living the holy life in the right way. It happens in solitude all by itself. And uh, uh, this is part of the uh, message here also that we found in the Bojangas, the awakening factors just before. One other little sutta, which uh, I always found very inspiring. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is the first sutta in the entire Connected Discourses uh, uh, collection. And it's called Crossing the Flood. And this particular sutta is uh, one of these current Cohen suttas. Yeah, you wonder really what, it, what quite what it means because it's quite an interesting in a sense. So uh, this is how this is how it goes. Uh, and so here you have a devata again, one of the uh, divine beings approaching Buddha and then standing to one side. And this man said to him, "How, how dear sir, did you use the flood?" By not halting, friend, and by not straining, by not making an effort, I cross the flood. But how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you cross the flood? Flood, when I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. But when I struggled, then I got swept away. <coughs> it is in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, and I crossed the flood. So it seems like a paradox, yeah. Either you, either you make an effort, yeah, or you uh, start, or you don't do anything. The kind of those other two things, right? That do one or other. What other alternative is there? It seems like some kind of paradox here. And um, and this, of course, is why it is interesting, yeah. As you cross a hold, nor do you really strive, nor do you try kind of try hard to get across. So, what is the alternative? And, and the alternative, of course, is this idea of getting into the flow of things. Yeah, doing things not because you are striving, but doing things as a matter of course because you have right humor, because you know what is right for yourself, you know what actually works. Yeah, you know what brings you forward. It is right to you that drives you forward rather than actually the striving inside. You're just going with the flow of things. You're going with the, the, the naturalness of the path. And this is exactly what we're doing in meditation practice. We're neither halting because we are there, we're watching the breath, we're trying to do the right thing, but nor are we striving when we're watching the breath. In fact, we're doing the exact opposite. We're letting go. We're now in right view to move us in the right direction. Because we understand that happiness is not to be found in the sensory world, our mind moves away from that sensory world by itself, by instinct, because that is not where, where contentment, happiness, satisfaction is to be found. And the mind dutifully, like a nice dog or like, some, or like a robot or whatever, just follows the instructions. Why does it follow the instruction? Because it knows that is what is meaningful and that is what creates happiness. The mind always goes towards happiness if it has the opportunity. So this is the beautiful thing about the Buddhist path. The Buddhist path is full of these kinds of instructions. The more I read it, the more obvious it becomes that the Buddhist path is about wisdom power, not willpower. We don't will ourselves to be more moral. We wise ourselves up to be more moral. Yeah, we just talked earlier on about how to overcome ill will and resentment. It is all about wisdom. It is all about learning how to think about people, how to perceive them, and bring that inside as something important in your mind, and then overcoming ill will. And of course, there is not much striving there. When you use wisdom, you don't really strive. What you do instead is that you just shift your attention you think in a different way. It's a very simple thing that takes a very small amount of effort. And that tiny amount of effort is really what is meant is wisdom in the driver's seat, not willpower. And then we are on the right track. And that happens then as you practice the path, the very practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, the first six that are all about morality and 
developing your mind and kindness and these kind of things. And then it happens even more so as you come to the meditation part, the Sammasati, the Satipatthanas, and the jhana factors of the palm. That is when this becomes very, very prominent, that there's no effort to be made. It's just going with the flow, allowing things to happen. It's a natural process, happens according to nature. If you try to do it, you will destroy what actually is a natural process. Yeah, this is kind of coming straight out of these two. So we learn then gradually to let it go. We learn to trust the process, trust the flow. Why? Well, because other people have done it before, because you have faith in these teachings, because you have done it partly. You know how it works this way. And anyway, the carrot at the end of the stick is so beautiful. Yeah. We can feel every step you take, the carrot is growing larger. You can see the carrot in view, it's heading in the right direction. We don't want to let go. We have every incentive to gradually let go in the right direction. And then the process happens by itself. And one of the most beautiful expressions of that process is actually found in the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing that takes us all the way from the very beginning all the way to the end of the path. So let's start now by having a, kind of getting acquainted with the Anapanasati Sutta. And then in the uh, second, uh, when we come back later on today, we will have a look at the rest of this Sutta. So uh, moving on then to uh, Majima Nikaya, middle length sayings number 118, Mindfulness of Breathing, Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, this is the fullest expression of mindfulness of breathing found in the suttas, but the general principle of mindfulness of breathing is mentioned in a large number of places. And the 16 steps that make up this sutta, that are the core of the sutta, are also found in a number of places. Yeah? So this is another core part of the Buddhist teachings. And as I pointed out before, and as you will see again as we go through this, it is very closely related to the factors of awakening, closely related to the process of liberation. The basic ideas are the stillness, the happiness, the samadhi, all of those things, all of those factors are found also in this particular sutta. So this is meditation. Meditation practice, yeah, in the most detailed, really, explanation as found in the sutta. So uh, let's uh, start to look at this. So uh, the sutta starts off as usual. So I have heard it. at one time the Buddha was staying near Samadhi in the Eastern Monastery in the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother, together with several well-known senior disciples, uh, such as the Venerable Sariputta, Mahamokalana, Mahakasapa, Mahak. Achana, Mahakotila, Mahakapila, Mahachunda, Anuruddha, Revata, Ananda, and others. So, uh, this is like the, the introduction, and of course, one of the points of an introduction like this is to say that this is an important sutta. Yeah? When all of the most senior disciples of the Buddha are present, uh, yeah, you can assume that this must be very important. Yeah? There's no mention of nuns here, but, but again, this is just how the suttas work. There may very well have been nuns present as well, they, but they tend not to be mentioned. So, as mentioned before, the emphasis on, is on the more senior people who are there. But uh, the point here is just to make and emphasize that this is an important teaching. Yeah? Everyone of importance is, is present, basically. Um, and the place that it happens is called the Eastern Monastery, the Balama in the Pali, and it's in the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother. And uh, uh, long, the stilt longhouse is a pasada, sometimes translated as mansion or even palace, which is really misleading. It doesn't mean that. Uh, it means a stilt house. And this was uh, and some research that I did myself. Actually, this is my piece of research, was I come into the, the suit. And, dealing with, with Ajahn Sujato about this, uh, because it looks like stilt houses was a common way of building buildings in ancient India for many reasons, because of the rain, the monsoon, all these kinds of things. Uh, 
And that makes more sense that the monks should be living in the towns. It does not make so much sense that they should live in a mansion, let alone a palace. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of slightly weird sometimes how these translations come about. Uh, and this stilt house was built by Megara's mother. Megara's mother, of course, is Visaka, Lady Visaka, uh, often considered to be the Buddha's chief female disciple, yeah, or lay disciple. And uh, this is the story why she is called Megara's mother. Basically, the reason is that she brought Megara, who was the father in law, and brought him to the Dhamma. And that is why she is called his mother. It's like his spiritual mother, if you like it. It's a really kind of touching and nice story there of the relationship between daughter in law and father. Anyway, let's leave that story out for now because it will take us too far to feel them. Uh, but let's, let's carry on and get into the uh, sutta. So uh, the Buddha says, mendicants, sir, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthana, sir. The four kinds of mindfulness meditation developed and cultivated fulfill the seven awakening factors. Sir. And the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom, vijja and vimuti. Yeah, so the point here, as I mentioned before, is that mindfulness of breathing, if you do it, actually fulfills the four satipatthanas. There's nothing else that you have to do. And this is a very important point, because if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, the Tata Sutta itself, if you read it, only has mindfulness of breathing as part of the first, as part of the body contemplation. Yeah, Those of you who are familiar with this would know this very well, that it is only found in the body contemplation. And so what happens is that many people that do Anathanasati for a while, and then when they think they are ready for the next stage, which, the, which is the contemplation of feelings, the Vedana Nupasana or Chitta Nupasana, they do something else. Because clearly, Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is only about the body. No, that's not the case. Mindfulness of breathing fulfills the entire Satipatthana practice. Yeah? And uh, it's a very important point, I think. Yeah? And then, of course, because the Satipatthana is all also include the Udanga, as I mentioned before, these are also fulfilled through the practice of Anapanasati. And we will see as we go through the Anapanasati Sutta very soon that all the factors of awakening are actually found within the Sutta developed through this practice. Yeah? This is also included in Anapanasati. Yeah? And then the result of developing the awakening factors is Vinsha knowledge and liberation, which being the understanding of the nature of reality, yeah, understanding of being suffering, impermanence, and all of that. That's the knowledge, that's the insight. Uh, in other words, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and the uh, liberation, the Vimuti, is the liberation from suffering. Yeah? Knowledge and liberation. Knowledge, understanding, and happiness always go together on the Buddhist path. In fact, they always go together everywhere in life. If you understand something rightly, then you can find happiness. Delusion is never going to make you happy. Yeah? So liberation, happiness and understanding, clarity, insight, and uh, what is beneficial for you all always go together. So that's very powerful. Leads to the highest insights and also the highest kind of happiness. So, so very exciting, right? So I hope you are excited now. Not too excited, just kind of enough to be uh, have to be interested, yeah. So then it says, Well, how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial? So, if you want to reach awakening, yeah, through using the mindfulness, just watching the breath, yeah, and this is what you do. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. The breath is such a humble thing, yeah, so that we carry with us throughout life, it is always there. 
if we had understood the potential of just the breath, yeah, we've never really understood the potential, so we kind of never really bothered about the breath. If we had understood the potential of this, we have been doing Anathanasati from the moment we were born, yeah, we would say to our mom, so anyway, let me sit up, cross my legs, I want to do Anathanasati because it's so powerful, man. It's kind of amazing how this very simple things in life, the very basic things in life can have so much power. A simple thing like the breath. And what is also so marvelous about the breath is that it is a natural phenomenon. It is not something that we have to make up. It is not some kind of great fantasy about, you know, thinking about this or picturing that. It's a very natural thing. We don't move it into fantasy land or into some kind of a you know, uh, some kind of uh, thing which we have no idea about, which might be dangerous or whatever. It's a very grounded thing, idea of watching the breath. There's something very, to my mind, very satisfactory about it, very trust inducing that we're using something so simple to cultivate the spiritual practice. So, how is it done? So, this is the uh, introductory paragraph on the mindfulness of breathing and of course as so often the introductory paragraph is probably the most important one because it lays down the foundations for how this is to happen so this is what the buddha says it's when a mendicant has gone to a wilderness or to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut they sit down cross legged with their body straight and establish mindfulness right there. Just mindful, breathe, mindful, they breathe out. Yeah, so this is the preliminary instructions. If we get these right, then this is going to work. Yeah? So this is really important for the meditation to work. So it starts off by talking about gone to a wilderness, root of a tree, or an empty hut. And of course, the idea here is that this is now serious meditation. You really get into serious meditation. Seclusion, again, is necessary. Yeah? Again, the same theme again. The idea of seclusion is right there. And whenever you read about meditation in the suttas in a serious way, it is always about seclusion, 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 seclusion. Uh, an empty hut. So this is why we have empty huts in our monastery. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and if you are really tough, then you can go to the wilderness of the wilderness of the tree. But an empty hut is probably the most common way of doing meditation practice. Uh, but, but in some ways, it's even better to sit at the root of a tree, yeah? Because then you are, even that hut is like a material thing that you might get attached to. Uh, at the root of a tree, there's very little pastures. That might be, in some ways, uh, the ideal situation. Sometimes we get out into nature, and meditate in nature. And then once you have found a seclusion, and that physical seclusion should then also lead to the seclusion of the mind. That's the important thing here. You could find meaning, seclusion from the five senses, and seclusion from the five hindrances. And yeah, this is kind of the where this leads to, that's the point of that. And then you sit down cross-legged. Um, so cross-legged is perhaps the ideal posture if you can do it. Again, as I mentioned before, it is not a requirement. People do get good meditation without sitting cross-legged. But if you can sit cross-legged a little bit, probably it's a good idea to try that because it is very stable and very solid and you feel very, it feels quite nice to sit cross-legged, put it that way. Yeah. Uh, and then you can change your posture a bit if you get lots of pain and have lots of problems. So it is more important to be comfortable more important to find the way than to have the kind of ideal posture as it is spoken about here. Then you straighten the body, it says here, you keep the body straight. And uh, an important point to remember here is that uh, when you have mindfulness, and the mindfulness, you have the clarity of the mind, it's as if the body wants to be straight. Yeah? So you don't have to force that posture so much. If you Straighten the body too early. Now, if you sit down and force yourself to sit straight, let's say if you are very tired or the body is fatigued or whatever, then often you will get tense as a consequence. 
So you have no way to straighten the body hair. So a very common thing which <coughs> many meditators advise is to start off by just relaxing it. Start off by leaning against the wall, by leaning against the back of the seat or whatever it is. And start with that because then you will be able to feel the mind and know when the mind is ready to sit straight. And then when the mind is ready, when you feel that mindfulness is established, you have a degree of clarity, that is the time to sit straight. And then the straight and natural. It will help you to enhance the meditation because that fitness has a degree of, of alertness to it. Yeah, the alertness will arise together with that. So use these instructions wisely. Yeah, don't force them. Don't, don't take them absolutely literally to all always be true. You know how to implement these things in the right way, so you don't actually um, make meditation more difficult. And then comes the very last part of the advice here. Yeah? You establish mindfulness right there. Satting parimukkha upatateta is the Pali phrase here. And uh, this is often debated a lot of parimukkha means, but uh, the uh, understanding of those that I trust the most, and from my own study of how this word is used, it's quite a rare word in the suttas. It basically just means he, right here and now, yeah, in the present, in the present, both in terms of time but also in space. Present in space, in other words, here in this space and in this time, yeah, right. In other words, that's why he has a right there, there yeah, right here, what we're doing now. So you don't think about another place, nor do you fantasize about the future or the past. You are here now. So this is a preliminary thing for mindfulness of breathing. First of all, you have to have the mindfulness. Yeah? And it's such a common thing for people to forget that mindfulness should be established first. You notice here, they have it. The Pali use a particular construction of the Pali, which means that it is pretty clear from the way this class said it here, but that is very clear from the Pali here. You do this first, then the mindfulness breathes. The mindfulness has to be established first. This is so critical. I know so many people who practice meditation and they sit down watching the breath right away. It is not really an ideal way of doing it. If you do it like that, you're likely not to make such good progress. You're likely to perhaps become tense. You like to not to enjoy the meditation. Do this stage-wise. Know the right time for everything. Yeah. So how do we establish the mindfulness? So the way you simply point your mind the right in, in the right direction. Yeah. Remember that the worldly things are not really interesting. The spiritual path is what you need. True goal sounds. You gently guide the mind, but first of all, you just relax. First of all, you just allow the world to fade away a little bit. And then, then as the world fades away, you use these little nudges of the mind to guide the mind in a little bit of joy. Yeah? And then the mindfulness will come about as you do that. Like all those instructions that we have been talking about before. Yeah? Then you are on the right track. Yeah? So allow mindfulness to come this way. And a very important part of this is to de develop mindfulness generally. Yeah? When I talk about developing mindfulness, I do not mean be mindful throughout the day. Um, it is good to be mindful to some extent through the day, but it's not really uh, so much a meditation exercise. The point of being mindful through the day is so that you can regulate your emotions, regulate your conduct, so you can live well. And it is because it is sila. We have seen this through, throughout here in morality, sila, ethics. This is the foundation for all meditation. So if you want to be mindful, that is what you have to focus on. It does not help just to be mindful during the day. It has to be the focus should really be on the ethics of your conduct. So one of the very, very important principles here that life lies behind it is the continual practice of virtue, always bringing it up to a higher level, seeing to be even more kind in your ordinary living, how you can think with more kindness and compassion and care. And as you do that, you will gradually overnight, all the months, all the, yeah, whatever it is, your mindfulness will 
become stronger and stronger and stronger. And we'll see meditation practice. Uh, but what it needs it is a very powerful commitment and dedication. That's the only way it's going to work out. Uh, and then when you you have all of these established when you are ready for mindfulness of breathing. So that is what we're going to come to next time uh, in the couple of hours time. But uh, for now, let us do a little bit for meditation together. Here. Okay, so just uh, gradually, slowly, patiently get into your meditation. And uh, as always, uh, start out with the basic things. Uh, and if you're already feeling really good, you can go through the basics very quickly if you want to. But uh, I think it's a good, good way of practicing just to make sure that everything is right. If everything is established in the right way, so that you are relaxed, the body is at ease, and, and you find that beautiful middle way without attention, but also without indulgence. We are just right, body, and the senses can be allowed to fade away here, and you are on the track towards meditation practice.
and to just experience the uh, delight of letting go of all the world outside and all that disturbance coming through the senses and all that disturbance coming through the ideas of the world. And letting go of all of that and going inwards instead uh, towards the peace and tranquility inside. Like that. Make sure you notice the pleasure of this, uh, because if you notice the pleasure, your mind will be drawn towards it, uh, and the path becomes much more automatic. Yeah.
And, uh, and uh, if you would like, just take a few moments uh, just to remind yourself of the quality that we're trying to develop on the spiritual path and what these qualities actually mean, what they feel like and how they are experienced. Uh, qualities like generosity, kindness, compassion, and love. And let's reflect on these qualities just very briefly. And then uh, gently remind yourself that there are so many people in this world with such qualities. Is that people who live in, people who live in, in a home in quite simple things. And what a wonderful thing it is to be able to share the world with these people. So thank you, all the good people out there in the world. Uh, people who help run up the world and make it a better place. Uh, thank, thank you for being here as a being part of this human existence. Uh, And then, then you wish you can expand your attention even further out because also the invisible beings in the world, uh, especially the devas in this world, uh, all, all these devas with these marvelous qualities uh, built up even to further extent, uh, the kindness, compassion, the love, the generosity, uh, beings who are full of these qualities. Uh, thank you for being and for sharing it with us uh, to brightening it up and making it a better place. Uh.
bring your attention to the people, all of us here are being part of this meditation retreat. Uh, every single one that is part of this, uh, and just remind yourself briefly uh, how fortunate you are to meet people like this in the world, uh, people with really super duper good intentions, uh, people in kindness and care and compassion. Uh, people who try to make their own lives a blessing for themselves and for others. The first thing it is to be able to meet such people in the world. Thank you everyone for coming on the retreat. Thank you for taking part. Thank you for being here and making the world the best. And uh, <clears throat> now I'll just uh, come back to your breath uh, just for a couple of minutes. Uh.
And uh, once again, uh, coming close to the end of the meditation, uh, and uh, again, uh, just feel how you feel now. Uh, and if you do feel more at ease, more relaxed, more uh, anything positive has arisen in your mind, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, how do these po positive qualities uh, come about? Uh, Okay, everyone, that's the meditation. We'll see you back again in a couple of hours. Yeah.